Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, first item will be public comments. We've got lots of folks here. Uh, we've had some public comments already, but if there's anybody here that would like to uh, uh, make public comments, now's the opportunity to, to step forward. Uh, State your name and address for the record and be heard on uh, city matters or items on the agenda. With no one coming forward, we're going to move to <coughs> presentation. Uh, and uh, Brian, we're going to welcome you to the podium. And you've got a couple of presentation items. Sure, one of them, I think relates back to, at least in some form or fashion, to questions that were raised during the CIP discussion. So presentation item number one, uh, winter weather operations for 14 and 15. Can you do something about the cold? I'll get on it. Okay. Um, thank you. As we do approach the onset, onset of the winter weather, uh, we did dodge one this past weekend, fortunately. Uh, the city is ready to deal with whatever, within reason, happens, from public works to parks to finance to police department building maintenance and the electric division. All departments are ready to assist when winter weather arrives. Uh, this year we also will be continuing with our real-time updates that we started last year. This past Friday we did post information about the upcoming storm, which didn't occur. Um, if the storm had materialized, we would have sent out email blasts and Facebook updates during the actual event. Uh, we do feel that it's important to get the information out to the public as it occurs. you know kind of how we do it in public works. Uh, when there is a forecast for snow or winter weather, uh, staff, uh, both operations and myself, begin monitoring weather reports and radar from multiple sources. We also have contact points to our west and south uh, that we talk to as the storm does approach. Um, at the start of the precipitation, uh, our crews are activated. The city does work two 12-hour shifts. Uh, we go 4 a.m. to 4 p.m. and then 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. There are, on average, eight trucks on the streets utilizing 12 Public Works employees with additional employees recruited from other divisions. That includes parks and that includes the finance department. We do clear approximately 190 lane miles of roadway um, and the city does do refresher training for our drivers as well as our new employees. Snowplow routes. This is actually one of the two bigger complaints we get. Um, we work on priority one and priority two routes first. Those are our main thoroughfares and our main collector and mainline residential roads. Uh, that is a continual process until the snow is removed and the snow has stopped. The biggest complaints we get are from people on the local residential roads and the cul-de-sacs because you may not see it for a day or two. I live off a cul-de-sac, off of a dead-end road. Last year, I didn't see anybody for about three days. So I, I can feel. Um, I would recommend that when you see us, um, please don't throw the snow shovel at us. Uh, cookies work really well. Um, when the forecast is for winter snow, uh, less than two inches, uh, plowing is not required. Sometimes salt trucks will spot treat the slick areas in town. If plowing is required, uh, drivers will refer to the priority map. We do priorities one and two continuously during snowfall. Priority three begins after priority two is complete and the snow has ended. Priority four, which are the cul-de-sacs, begin at the very end. It does take crews between eight and 12 hours to apply de-icing materials and 24 to 36 hours to plow the city for one full cycle. 
This does depend on the intensity of the snow events and the number of parked cars and traffic volumes. Um, as I stated earlier, the city will post updates on the website and the social media during snow removal operations. One thing we do ask is that the citizens do remove cars, basketball goals, and other hazards from the roadway during plowing operations. This does allow the streets to be plowed more effectively. The other thing that was actually discussed a little bit at the last meeting, uh, we had a resident um, come in and talk about snow removal on sidewalks. Per our municipal code, the owner and or occupant of a property abutting the sidewalk is responsible for removing snow and ice from the sidewalks within 48 hours of the snow exam. Uh, one thing that's the other big complaint we get is probably a couple of you had your driveways plowed in. You spent a lot of time cleaning it and our truck goes by and plows off the end. Um, do you know that when your streets are plowed, the snow will go into your driveway? What we have here is kind of a diagram that suggests a way to clean around your driveway. Snow plows travel in the same direction as the cars travel. Um, so we pick up the snow that before we get to your driveway and that's what we put in it. So anything you can do uh, to go a little bit downstream of your driveway, clean that out a little bit, that's less snow for us to put in your driveway. Uh, with that said, um, we will get snow in your driveway. And with that said, we do not go back and remove the snow from the entrance. Uh, building community relations. Um, this is something that our crews have been really excited about. Uh, we do do uh, touch a truck demonstrations. Uh, we go out to the daycares uh, and the kids just absolutely love it. One thing we did start this year in the Public Works Department, we contacted the school district about painting our snow plows. Um, what you see before you is three of our plows that were painted this year, one by Moonlight Elementary, one by Trail Ridge Middle School, and one by Grand Star Elementary. Um, but honestly, I think our guys had more fun than probably the kids did. <laughs> um, we think it was a success. We have a plow um, that we can do this for, and we hope next year uh, we get some competition between the schools. Um, like I said, our guys just love this. Uh, the one thing that we also, I mentioned earlier, is the departments work together. Uh, teamwork's <coughs> key and snow removal. Um, you see before you, Jeff and I working on snow. As you see, I'm older than Jeff, but I'm substantially out in front of him. Um, <laughs> winter is coming and we're ready. Uh, we can research winter weather predictions for our region. region you can see that no one agrees. Um, however, everyone here and Cheryl is learning that Kansas can defy the best guess. <laughs> the city of Gardner is ready for whatever comes our way. Our crews have been trained, our equipment is tested, and our material bins are full. So whatever happens, our crews will be ready to work to keep our residents on the road. <laughs> so presentation item number two is an update on initial review of public improvements in the Americans with Disabilities Act. Again, thank you, Mayor. Um, during your October 6th meeting, Staff did provide an update on measures the city is taking, both past and present, to comply with ADA. During that update, staff stated that we would be conducting an initial internal review of our public buildings, parks, and infrastructure. And we wanted to update you this evening on the status of that review. Okay. The areas that we reviewed are our public access buildings, as being City Hall, the police station and our senior center. In parks, we did review a portion of the aquatic center, sections of our trail and our neighborhood parks. On our infrastructure, we looked at our crosswalks, ADA ramps and our signalized intersections. It should be noted that at the time of original construction, public access buildings, park facilities and public infrastructure were designed to be compliant with the regulations in place at that time. Our initial review is not a certified audit. It is an initial review to begin the process of identifying areas where improvements are needed. 
these areas will need to be prioritized by the community as we move forward. And it should be noted this review is a continual process. Regulations <coughs> change, additional areas will be reviewed, and we may have missed a few items. In addition to our public building codes, which provide a safeguard to the public health and safety of all communities, large and small, the Americans with Disabilities Act, known as ADA, provides added measures to help ensure the opportunity is available for every citizen of Gardner to access and benefit from the city's local facilities. With that, I'll say new facilities and alterations in existing structures need to meet both the Title II regulations outlined in the 2010 ADA standards as well as the 2012 International Building Code. As far as City Hall, we've listed a partial list of items that we found in our review. Portions of the sidewalk do exceed the 2% cross slope. Um, both the drinking fountains are 29 inches wide, it should be 30. Uh, both are 36 inches above the finished floor, <coughs> one should be 43. And some of these items may be, seem minor, but they are very important to those with disabilities. All doors and accessible routes exceed the five pound push limit and they travel too fast, and restrooms need a vertical grab bar. Police department, a <coughs> couple of the big ones there, the front counter at 42 inches exceeds the maximum height. Uh, restrooms within the facility are unable to meet many ADA requirements. Detainment bench does not comply with ADA. The main hall is 44 inches wide, ADA requires 48. And for ADA, you can't have the standard door knobs. It needs to be a lever. Uh, one of the projects that was actually mentioned tonight in the CIP discussion was the senior center. Um, all doors exceed five pound push limit and travel too fast. Doors need lever type knobs. There's issues with ADA signage. Uh, maneuvering space on both sides of the accessible doors is needed. Counters and kitchen are too high. The big one, restrooms are too narrow, numerous inches issues not functional for wheelchairs, walkers, or ambulatory use. And the ADA parking spaces have no signs, faded pavement markings, the access aisle is too narrow, and spaces are not located uh, to the closest accessible entrance. So there are a number of issues with the senior center. <coughs> Parks and Recreation on the Aquatic Center, access door does exceed the five pound push limit. Um, there's some clear floor space required on each side of the door, so someone can be beside the door and open it up. Um, there's no compliant benches in the shower. The laboratory is too low, the code hooks are too high, um, and it does not have the required ambulatory stall. Uh, for the neighborhood parks and trails, um, I'm going to go ahead and show the next picture. But there's a number of issues. They aren't at all the parks, and some of the parks are in fantastic shape. Uh, other parks just have minor issues, but they are important. Um, no accessible parking stalls or accessible parking lot surface. The upper left, the parking areas gravel. The second picture shows a water fountain. The water fountain is ADA accessible, you just can't get to it. Um, the third one is actually Westside Park. Uh, the surface within the park is not ADA accessible, and the building and restrooms are not ADA compliant. Uh, the other pictures in there include uh, playground equipment, um, benches, those types of things that are great, except you can't get to them. Public infrastructure, uh, this was an eye opener to public works. We thought we had about 40 crosswalks. We did a, a photo documentation of all of our crosswalks. We actually have 94 marked crosswalks within the city. Um, with that said, the pavement markings on a lot of them are faded and worn. Our pavement markings are not consistent. Signage is not current or has been, or has reduced reflectivity uh, and walks lead to raised curbing. The picture on the left has a really nice ADA ramp at the bottom. It shoots you across to the north where you can't get up on the sidewalk. Uh, the picture on the right shows, um, quite honestly, what's kind of typical right now for our crosswalks is very faded. Uh, pavement markings. ADA ramps, at last count, we had 1,134 ramps within the city. 21% comply with the latest ADA requirements, 79% do not. 
That doesn't mean we have to run out and fix something. But there are some things that trigger us to fix. Um, if a resident requests, we can re replace or, or upgrade. But also when we do major maintenance on a road, uh, when we mill and overlay a road, when we put a surface seal on a road, we are required to bring the ADA ramps that tie into that road into compliance. Uh, there's a couple pictures. The one on the left you might think looks compliant, um, but what's happened is we've put our truncated <coughs> domes too close to the edge, and what's happened, the pavement has broken out. And so you'll see truncated domes, it has a nice landing, it has a transition, uh, and it's got missing concrete. The one on the lower right, um, there's too many things wrong with that one to really even discuss. Traffic signals, there are 10 signalized intersections within Gardner. The latest intersection, including 183rd and Center, and Center and Main comply with current ADA guidelines. Other signalized intersections, there are some issues. ADA ramp crosswalks not current, missing pedestrian signals, pedestrian push buttons not properly located, cross slopes are off, and the audible and vibratory pedestrian crossings may or may not be present. The lower right actually shows a grand and moonlight. That's a good intersection. The upper left is just down the street. If you look at that intersection, no ADA ramps, no crosswalks, and look at where the pedestrian signal is. How does someone get to the bus? So those are the types of issues that we found that the summary, when buildings, parks, and public infrastructure are constructed, they typically comply with the adopted codes that are in place at the time of construction. Our initial review of our buildings, parks, and public infrastructure for ADA compliance identifies a number of areas where upgrades are needed. For our public access buildings and park structures, a plan will be developed and funding requested to complete the upgrades within a reasonable time frame. The council with input from the community should prioritize these improvements. Staff will finish reviewing all public improvements and will continue to update as new requirements are adopted. And we as city staff will continue to look for funding and grant opportunities to help with these needed improvements. Thank you, Mr. Anybody have questions for Brian about this or? I, I just have one. So Brian, is there a recommended, I mean, if we would go through tomorrow and approve correcting all of this and as you said, um, anything <coughs> newly constructed, we take into consider considerations current regulations. What what would be a time frame or an acceptable time frame for a review? So should we be planning to review this every two years, every three years, where we go back out and do some sort of assessment? Well, quite honestly, I think every year in the budget process, uh, we need to provide an update to council on where we are. <coughs> uh, the things that are very critical, quite honestly, are our structures, our buildings because that's what we need to have a transition plan uh, where we identify all these areas and then have a plan in place where we make those upgrades. I mean, it doesn't have to occur overnight, but it needs to be a plan with a reasonable time frame. So, and that's what we've done with the, the three public structures. The one thing with the senior center that I'll say is it's new construction or alterations. So when we go through and make alterations to the senior center, um, we should definitely be working towards bringing the restrooms and other parts of that structure <coughs> into compliance with ADA. Are we running into the same thing with the aquatic center since we're doing improvements to that now? Actually what you're doing is <coughs> you're not improving the structure itself, you're oh, working on the, on the well. lat length. Okay. Um, Brian, I got a question, a couple of questions actually. Um, when we're talking about, uh, we had discussed as part of this process of, of doing discovery on the roads, and doing, you know, having pavement management so we know what, what, what payments the grading was, what roads need to be replaced. Um, can ADA be built into that process so that we can, you know, make sure, so we can have a pretty decent idea of exactly what would be coming up on, you know, our maintenance? And then, and the second thing I had, the question I had was, are we looking to pursue additional community development money to be able to assist and pay for part of that ADA? I don't think from a, on the second question if we actually identified exactly what we would be applying for in 2016. Okay. Um, I believe each year it's 100,000. You can do a two-year request for 200,000. Okay. Um, but I don't believe that uh, we've got that far to think through that process yet of what we'd apply for going into the 2016 season. Um, 
as far as roads, the nice thing about roads, if we do a block, say we do a block mm -hmm. on Washington Street, uh, the most will have is four ramps. Uh, they'll run $1,500 to $2,000 a piece. And so in the overall scheme of things, it's, it's a fairly minor expense. Um, but when you look at the total number of ramps, um, if we say we have roughly 900 that are not in compliance, and you take that times $2,000 a piece, um, I think you're pushing about 1.8 million. So, I mean, it, there's big numbers for that. <coughs> Brian, I know that uh, we did a little updating on, on reporting for ADA uh, complaints. Can you address that? <coughs> at all about what we've, what we've done identifying a coordinator? Um, yeah, the uh, <coughs> city is going to be appointing an ADA coordinator, yeah. um, looking at the job description and what's required for that. Um, and I think that decision is going to happen very quickly. Um, the also, uh, there is a complaint procedure that we're updating uh, to make sure that people um, that have a complaint can get it properly filed and get a response from the city. So. We are talking about the ADA coordinator that's, this is an additional duty to what they're already doing. That, that is correct. Right. It's, not a, it's not a new We're position. not hiring them. Right. Right. And, and the city, quite honestly, does need to have one voice. Yeah. Uh, when someone has a concern, I mean, if they come to me and they come to somebody else, and I mean, we need to have that one unified voice um, when we talk to them. All right, well, very good. Thank you so much for sharing this uh, information. Next on the agenda is the consent agenda. Is there any council member that would like to remove an item from the consent agenda? If not, I would entertain a motion. Some of Second. Motion to shoot, second Freeman, that we approve the consent agenda. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Consent agenda passes. Uh, new business item number one. Consider selecting a vice president of the council. Uh, former council member Larry Fotovich served as the vice president of the council. Now that Mr. Fotovich's position has been filled by council member winners, uh, a new vice president needs to be appointed. Uh, and uh, if both the mayor and council president are temporarily absent, the council vice president presides over the city council meeting. Council member Harrison holds the position currently of council president. The governing body rules of procedure dictate that a vice president shall be appointed from members of the city council by a majority <coughs> vote at its first regular council meeting in April following a regular municipal election. Uh, so this will be done again in April of 2015. With that being the case, I would hear recommendations uh, and or motions to appoint a council member as council vice president. I'd like to nominate Steve Shute as vice president of the city council. Second. Uh, motion Roberts, second uh, Harrison, that we appoint council member Steve Shute as council vice president. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Congratulations, Mr. Council Vice President. New business item number two. Consider a second one-year extension of the agreement for fire rescue services with Johnson County Fire District number one for the period of January 1st, 2015 through December 31st, 2015. Good evening, Laura. Oh, did you wait? Oh, I did not. I thought you were wanting to say something. Sorry. Um, at the governing body's direction, you, you know we already have a fire services contract we entered in 2010 with Johnson County Fire District Number One, and it's subject to three additional one-year renewals. We've already done one. Um, at the governing body's direction, last year you asked for us to come to you with some options for to be implemented for the 2016 budget. Um, staff has met with some other area entities as well as Johnson County Fire One, and they are here tonight to bring you an update on their services as well as their proposal for 2016. So with that, I will introduce um, Fire Chief Kirk and Assistant Fire Chief Dennis Myers. Thank you, Laura. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening, Chief. How's everybody doing? Doing very good, thanks. 
And I think you've already received the packets concerning the annual report for, for last year. Uh, I just want to give you a couple of highlights. So last year we, we had, ran 1,834 calls, 1,314 of them were in the city of Gardner, which equates to about 72% uh, percentage of, of calls being around the city of Gardner. Of those calls, EMS, we ran 923 uh, for an average response time of 3 minutes and 54 seconds and fire 391 for an average response time of three minutes and 51 seconds. Uh, we have put a proposal together for you uh, after some questions of last year. I'd like to call Assistant Chief Dennis Myers up here to show you a short uh, PowerPoint on what we've put together for you. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, Dennis. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present our proposals to you. Uh, first, we think it's important that we took a look at a little bit of the history. Prior to the merger in 2010, Gardner had two fire stations. We had one firefighter stationed at each station as a driver. On-duty police officers would respond to and perform firefighting duties and EMS duties. What that really means is if we had a fire situation, they would respond to the call take off their gun belts, get in their trunk, put on firefighting gear, and go to work as firefighters. Police officers at the time were trained to first responder level EMS. That is the first level of EMS training. <coughs> no fire inspections were performed in the, in the city at that time. Presently, we have four fire stations within the district. Station one, staff of three firefighters at New Century. Station two is staff of three firefighters at 183rd Street. Station three houses the medic unit which is more centrally located for the city and is staffed by our volunteers on Park Street. Station four is staffed by two firefighters at Edgerton. There's an on-duty battalion chief seven days a week, 24 hours a day, that also responds to critical calls, EMS and fire. All career firefighters are medically trained to EMT level and higher, which is just below a paramedic. Fire inspections and plan reviews are completed by the on-duty battalion chiefs at this time. Calls for 2013, there were 2,075. 74% of those were within the city. And as the chief just stated, we're still at 72% year to date on that annual report. <coughs> we thought we'd take just a little bit, uh, look at uh, staffing levels. Uh, Fire District 1 as a whole, if we take the whole district in the city of Gardner, the population is approximately 25,000. One firefighter protects 862 people. Our average response time throughout the whole district is four minutes and 44 seconds. If we look at just the city of Gardner with 20,000 population, one firefighter protects 869 with the average response time is three minutes and 51 seconds. This is a comparison for the city of Olathe. 129,000 people, one firefighter protects 1,104. City of Oakland Park, 176,000, they protect 1,000 and 1,134, sorry. Uh, Olathe's average response time is four minutes and 43 seconds, and Oakland Park's four minutes and 11. The national average for response time is five minutes, so we're well within that response time. I think it's important we talk a little bit about what's happening around the district with the assessed valuation changes. As you're well aware, the logistic park is up and running. Uh, the DeLong grain elevator is in full operation. We have three major warehouses out there that are in full operation and leased. And we just uh, saw a completion of the Unilever edition, multi-million dollar edition, which all adds to the assessed valuation for the fire district outside the city of Gardner. Talking with uh, management at the uh, Intermodal, they are ahead of their lip rate that they projected for at this time. They're considering adding more rails and more cranes at this time, which is increases the production out there. What does that mean for all of us? More warehouses. At the present time, Inland Port 11, 750,000 square foot warehouse is due to be completed in April. There's a, a pad site just right next to it. It's also due to be completed in April. Both of these warehouses are leased, and they actually like to have an empty warehouse ready to go for the next client, and they can't keep up with the warehouse that they're building out there. Here's what it's doing to assess valuation. As you're all aware in 12, 2012, 2013, with the poor economy, we all took a little bit of hit on assess valuation. Fortunately, in 2014, we're starting to come out of that. 
We had a 3.8% increase in our assessed valuation. The city of Gardner had about a 1%. In 2015, our assessed valuation is going up 17%. And the majority of that's coming from the intermodal and from the warehouses logistics park. The city is projected or is going to have a 5.6% increase. We've got numerous meetings with Paul Welcome, the county assessor, and he said realistically we could count on about a 6% increase for 2016, and that's a very conservative number in his opinion. And we believe the city is going to use about a 3% increase for 2016. Our proposal change for 2016 would, to, would be to eliminate the contract with the city. The residents of the city become part of the fire district. Cost of fire and EMS service for the, fire, for the city would be funded through the fire district's mill levy. What advantage to the city? The city would no longer fund fire and EMS from the general fund. Cost of services is spread out over the fire district equally. Fire district's assessed <coughs> valuation uh, is growing a lot faster than cities, and this equates to lower mill levies for fire service. Additional fire and EMS personnel could be added. Our full-time fire marshal will be in place to help us with the new construction and inspection. And most importantly, since the merger, the ISO, which is an, an independent company that comes in and evaluates the fire department on their capabilities of putting out fire, did a rating on the fire district. We were able to improve from a class six to a class four, and class one being the best, class 10 being the worst, that equates to approximately fifty to one hundred dollars savings annually for each for an average homeowner. We actually have uh, Sean here with us, Snyder, with one of our local insurance agents. He also did a study on this, and he'd like to give you his findings from his clients. Sean. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I I first to get a little background information. <coughs> As many of you are aware, I'm sure uh, everybody's homeowners insurance rates uh, literally have hundreds of different moving parts, obviously, that helps determine uh, what those rates are going to be. And one of those uh, key factors is the ISO rating. So I had um, kind of a unique thing going on with my company about two years ago, we started a process uh, where I, my company began to rate, a, as one of those factors, I should say, began to uh, transition from just applying uh, a rate based on the fire district you were in, based on your zip code, and we're transitioning that to individual ISO rating. And <clears throat> kept looking into it further and further, and within for example, uh, Gardner 66030 area code, we had ratings of anywhere, um, most of them everywhere was around a six. And kind of tongue in cheek, a time or two uh, talking with Rob, I asked him simply, how could it be that Gardner had an ISO rating of six, uh, at, but with all due respect to surrounding cities like Edgerton, how could they possibly have a five and Baldwin City have a four? Um, and so I began to look more and more into it because of the timing of my company. Um, I, I could just simply click on a button as we were transitioning in our system from the zip code rating to the ISO rating and just simply see what kind of discount was that going to mean for Gardner, the, the, the city of Gardner, by going from a six to a four. And so I, I, I began to do some random samples of my clients within the city. Um, I'll note that I asked every one of them if it was all right if I did that, because um, that's kind of what I felt like I needed to do. Um, I, I'll say that I, I looked at homes and ranging values uh, everywhere from around a hundred thousand dollar home to about a three hundred and fifty thousand dollar home and when I just simply clicked the button it uh, it gave me those basically what the discount would be <coughs> and I have to point out I see it it says fifty to a hundred in savings uh, that's very conservative to the numbers that I gave them um, that when I when I did that 
it, it was everywhere between 80 and 100 or 125 dollars. So, uh, pretty significant savings in the insurance world uh, by uh, by taking a look at that. One thing I didn't do that I, I want to point out is is simply what what effect will that have on commercial buildings? I didn't even think about that. I didn't conceive that. And if if you assume the same type of percentages of discounts are going to be placed in commercial properties as residential, you can uh, you can see that where. Uh, those those insurance rates for commercial buildings, higher dollar amounts, the prices, the premiums, annual premiums are greater. Applying the same percentage to a higher higher premium is going to relate to even greater savings uh, than than what I pointed out. Um, I just wanted to give some perspective uh, from uh, my viewpoint on how positive going from a six to a four would be. Um, frankly. <coughs> I think it can obviously get even lower, uh, the ISO rating that is, and uh, savings be even greater. So. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Okay, uh, with that, we move on. We actually have two requests of the council tonight. <coughs> The, obviously, the first request would be for you to renew the contract for one more year for 2015. Our second request would be for you all to take into consideration that we would like to ask you to approve the city staff and the fire district to proceed with putting properties covered by the fire district within the city limits of Gardner under the tax authority of the fire district beginning in 2016. We think this is a great opportunity that the residents of Gardner and the city of Gardner are going to be able to take advantage of a lot of the assessed valuation, the growth outside of the city, and that all relates to lower, lower costs to the residents of Gardner and the residents of district uh, for fire and service, fire and EMS services. So that's our quest, request for tonight. We'll be happy to answer any questions for you or talk about. Um, can you talk a little bit, one of the numbers and one of the things that we've talked about is kind of this whole uh, cost benefit um, uh, under this, this agreement and moving to a um, fire district, the, the 2016 recommendation. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, cost uh, per person? Um, because those are pretty significantly <coughs> different. Sure, sure I can. Uh, what we did is we did evaluate that a little bit and uh, we used the 2014 budget to evaluate that and if we took everybody within the district and put them in one group which include the residents of, of Gardner the cost would be approximately $110 a person if we just took the the residents in Gardner and divided <laughs> the amount of money that you all pay us under contract I believe the residents are paying about $58 per person which in essence, you know, there's a little bit of subsidy going on with the people in the county subsidizing the, the uh, cost in the city of Gardner. If we looked at the city of Olathe and use those same numbers, it's about $129 per person in the city of Olathe. If you look at the fire district that's just to the east of us, fire district two, their cost is approximately $246 per person. Uh, and they have a pro about 20,000 20, people that they protect. I don't know if that answers your question. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Laura, did you have anything else as far as presentation goes, or can we open it up for public comment? Well, okay. may I have one thing to go back? Yeah. So when we talk about the 2016, what um, what will that look like? So so staff would work with the fire district, and then would that come back before council, or would it just be we would come back to council. Okay, so that would be, this would all happen with the 2016 budget, basically. That is correct, okay. and that's what the request was for it to happen with the 2016 budget. So given the tasks that are required to do this, we thought it, we needed to bring it to you now, which is substantially before you asked that it come back. You asked right. that it come back in 16. Yep, okay, got it. I think with that in mind, it, when that is brought back before council, it, it, it's critically important that the numbers are laid out just as plainly as possible to show the impact, the cost impact <laughs> from the tax standpoint to the residents and how it will impact um, just what the, the, the cost associated will be and how that impacts a single resident. Okay. 
Uh, I mean, as clearly as we can possibly make that with as much information as part of the analysis as we can provide and how those figures were calculated. Okay. Uh, real quick, as part of what we do, this is where we open up the floor for public comments. Sure. If, if I could just make one statement about uh, sure. that. If, if we're leaning towards making the change, like we suggested, that's going to take some time for us to do also because there's some probably legal things that we're going to have to do in there. So we don't want to delay that decision. So maybe we need to come back as quick as we could to mm -hmm. to get a firm decision, yes, that's the direction we need to go. Because you know in June, we have to be ready to do our next budget. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's, it's September to the city, so. Before yeah. that. We're, we're I was done by that point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. right. Uh, I, think, okay. I think that you'll find us willing to help. I appreciate you and, and Chief Kirk showing up this evening. I recognize a number of Fire District 1 uh, board members in attendance too. I yes. appreciate you guys coming out. Uh, they're all this is scattered throughout the audience. It's extremely yeah. important to us and the city, I believe. Yes. Thank you. I understand. With that, uh, we'll open up new business item number 24, public comments. Anybody having comments about new business item number 2, they can step forward. Uh, State their name and address for the record and be heard. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, David Dravetta, 735 North Mulberry Street, Gardner, Kansas. Uh, <clears throat> as you recall, uh, some of you may, may not, the, uh, the drive to move to this original agreement was based on the community's desire to have a separate police force and a separate fire department distinct and individual. Uh, at the time, uh, that was very cost prohibitive uh, for the city to take on additional uh, salary necessary uh, to accomplish that. And so uh, a, very, a very good and fair agreement was reached uh, with the fire district. Uh, I believe over the years uh, we have seen very good service from our fire district in response to calls in Gardner. I can personally attest uh, that our family had experienced a, a call earlier this year uh, and uh, it was very quick, very professional, outstanding. Uh, back when we uh, talked about this, uh, we said those individuals uh, who are in need don't really care if it's a green truck or a red truck, just as so long as it is a truck showing up. So from my position, I think uh, at the very least, uh, the city should continue the contract. Uh, and I believe it is time uh, that we move toward <coughs> incorporating uh, our boundaries within the district and move uh, the revenue into that, uh, into that taxing entity. I think uh, the council could proceed with that and make it a, uh, a net neutral change uh, for the residents based on the budget. Uh, but I think it is, uh, it is the appropriate time uh, for us to move in that direction and uh, continue our relationship with Fire District 1. I don't think we will uh, grow in the near future to a size that would warrant uh, or give us the ability to pay for a standalone department within the city limits. And uh, with the growth, the commercial growth outside of uh, the, the city limits, um, the opportunity for uh, improved savings uh, will continue. So thank you all very much for your time. Thank you, David. Actually, the number that we used was per person, but when you figure in the assessed valuation into it, it kind of looks at it a little bit different. In order to get a comparison to Olathe and Overland Park, to see what, you know, that's just a, a number for comparison. Uh, we figured those were kind of one. Uh, actually, I got my tax bill today. Um, 
my residence and it was like four hundred and twenty five dollars for the fire district. So that fifty-eight dollars is fifty-eight dollars per person per that we're person. paying now. Yeah. It's okay. easy to do uh, the city because we have a fixed number that they're paying us a fixed contract amount. So we just divided that by the number of persons in the city. Okay. Thank you. Uh, questions for Laura or oh I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my name again. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Bruce Hughes, I'm 322 East Colleen Drive still. Have moved. Um, the, the questions I would have was following up on Heath is in addition to looking at getting very detailed about those costs, not just in terms of per person, per mill, how the tax is actually going to be assessed <coughs> if that change happens. I would want to, you know, be able to see mm -hmm. that, but also on the saving side from the city, what is the, the actual savings the city's going to see when this revenue is shifted over to the tax base of the, uh, the, the, the citizens as opposed to the city government? Because it's going to come in terms of the contract savings as well as, I would assume even the city would have some insurance savings if everybody else is getting a lower rating based on their ISO drop. So if we get that as well, it would probably, I guess, go along with what you were asking for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> you have a question? Yeah, I, I, I uh, Bruce, who, who would it be for? It would be for the assistant chief. Um, the, the question I had was, uh, it, it was actually pertaining to liability. I mean, right now, does our contract, um, our contract doesn't shift liability at all to the, to the fire district. Am I correct in that? It's a, it's a contractual relationship. We still assume the liability for well uh, I'm, I'm to some not. degree you know obviously we're insured like everybody else but we all fall under the courts claims courts claims act mm -hmm. to where we're the limitation on that but uh, uh, if we do something wrong out there we're insured for that to take okay. care of that too uh, even though you are contracting right there you segregated down to where if we actually did something that was inappropriate Include, that includes the assets, the hard assets like the lift, like the book trucks and things like that. That those are those you've actually they're assumed they're ownership they're of those. Those so are you have a liability on Yeah, that. so they're they fully insured. If we hit somebody out here, they're they're covered okay. through all policy. The other question I had was about ISO, and mm -hmm. that is you know, the, the lower from six to four. That is because of the additional staff, EMTs, That's and correct. the fire marshal that would be dedicated to the district. Well, right. right, but he also serves both the dis. If the fire marshal would serve the city also, uh, we we do all the plans review and everything for the city. But the ISO takes a lot of things into consideration: mm -hmm. water supplies, dispatch, our capabilities, staffing levels, fire prevention activities, mm -hmm. fire inspection activities. Right on down the line. I mean, there is a list of a gamut of things that uh, sure. they take a look at. So, but the projection, the projections that you have. Going, to, going from six to four um, are based on, I'm assuming, some sort of formulaic calculation. That, that's start. actually been, it's already been, we've already been graded on that, and it yeah. is down to a four. It's okay. already at a four. All right. So we've already accomplished that. Okay, super. Thank you. You know, I was very pleased with the, with the response time numbers. Uh, uh, judging from what we're hearing from our, our friends at the fire district, we've, we've had a very good deal for a long time and because of increased evaluations uh, outside the, the city limits, uh, by the time 2016 rolls around, we're still going to have a good deal. Now, this will be, this will require a lot more, uh, uh, you know, numbers and having them presented, but uh, uh, we certainly enjoy our partnership with Fire District Number One. So, uh, <coughs> felt it needed to be said, uh, like like uh, Mayor Gravetta, uh, Fire District <coughs> Fire helped uh, me out with a situation with uh, a family member in the area. So, uh, and wow, great service. So, uh, Laura, there you are. Here I am. Um, so, first step would be please renew for 2015 so that I have authorization to pay them beginning in January because otherwise 
they're not going to be happy. They do invoice for their services. Sure. And the second step would be clarification. Mm -hmm. is, our, is it the consensus of the governing body to move forward with fire district number one with their proposal and bring you back the components? Because it's going to take quite some time and you're in your 2016 budget year basically now. Well, considering that the renewals, we, we're running out of them. Well, you still have, you still have one more. We still have one more. We are, we're in plenty of time, sure. but but it's going to take some time. Like they said, there's some yeah. legal structures, and and you want to see some no more numbers. Uh, in addition, I mean, you already saw that their assessed valuation is trending two and a half times mm -hmm. faster than ours, and that's not going to change. So you're going to get economy of scale. The subsidy from the outside area is going to go. Mm -hmm going to get more and more so it's going to be better yeah so but we I have not yet heard a consensus directive yes no. staff move on uh, I would entertain a motion to second. approve the contract second. Right. motion Harrison second Freeman that we approve the second one-year extension of the agreement for fire rescue services with Johnson County Fire District number one for the period of January 1st, 2015 through December 31st, 2015. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Um, there's the direction for the first part. Okay. Uh, <coughs> you know, this is this is a this is a council decision, but I, I'm my opinion is that we move forward with to maintain our relationship and and make sure that we maintain it in 2016 and beyond uh, by doing the due diligence necessary to uh, move forward on on consolidating the fire district seven. I would questions, agree. Comments. I'd agree. I would agree, but I think that we need to. I, I don't know what that time frame is. If, if it's February or what have you, have all the numbers laid out so that we can do a comparison. So whatever it takes to get there and give us plenty of time to make that decision based on those actual numbers. So actual, that's, so let's well, talk I mean, about that for a minute. The assess, um, right. So a lot of the details. I know that there were, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, are there, there's a lot of different things that were looked at. I know there's some trends on the mill levies, mm -hmm. the actual, um, what that is proposed to look, mm -hmm. look at. I think that we should have a clear understanding taking some assessed value of some different um, levels of housing and have that all laid out. Okay. Where it would fall under the contract and where it would fall without the contract. I would agree. That's that's kind of what Councilman Freeman asked for earlier, I believe. Is that what you were? Yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's, that's kind of what we're looking for. It's just give us a side-by-side -side comparison. Give us the cost benefit between the two proposals and, you know. And, you know, even more to add on to that, you know, the, the one thing, when we look at projections, they're simply that projection. Mm -hmm. But the nice thing that we do have is historical data. Mm -hmm. So we can actually compare <coughs> what the impact would have been if we'd have been under a similar plan, even over the past three years with what the assessment values are and what difference that would have been in the cost of service. Knowing that will change in the future, but that will actually give us a, a number to compare to the, the facts at that point. And we know what the assessment value was in 2014. How would that have impacted under the proposed structure versus what we actually pay contractually and how that would impact a resident if we'd had the plan in place for all of 2014. Well, so we've done those studies, mm -hmm. which is why you've all, we did that study in 2012 as required before the first extension. Great. And then I updated it last year and the mills were not projected to equalize by 2016 and they still won't probably because they're growing much faster than we are, but they, we were bigger to start with. Sure. But it's getting very close. Paul Welcome, County Appraiser Welcome said for them to use six, well you saw it was 17, so the numbers that you heard tonight, 17% increase for them, that was the 2015 budget numbers. Right. Ours was 5.8, I think it was, 5.6 or 5.8. So we won't get new numbers from Mr. Welcome until February. Um, you can expect based on the same trend and you can see what's going on around you because they get to have New Century and the intermodal. Um, it's probably going to be based on the same. So what I'm hearing is I can take the same trend line and say, okay, assume there's this, instead of the six and three we're currently using, let's say it's two and a half times what ours is. 
and we can lay out for a home of this value, for a right. whatever. Yeah. Your, your mills right now, because I, I happen to know, having spent some time with them, that they're probably going to decrease theirs in the next year. <coughs> they're getting very close to equalization. And the difference could be, in addition to whatever you decide, the difference in the ISO rating. So you're getting very close to that. Would you like that little component included as well? Um, yeah. Okay. So the total calculus. I mean, it really as much as we. I mean, it's still a projection. Absolutely, but as much information as we have to present okay. and swallow at the same time, so it is a fully understood presentation, and the impact can't be questioned at that point. Obviously, there can be unforeseen circumstances that relate to it, but when we come to the decision time, we've got as much information as possibly could have been presented to us. I mean, on its face, I mean, if you look at it just based on what we see with the school district, which is, you know, kind of in a similar situation where you have a lot of assessed properties for the school district outside the city limits, and looking at what the impact has been for assessed valuations on the school district, it would make sense to say that this would be a very good deal for the city. Right. But let's let's take let's Let see the number. I can throw a few more components at you just down the sure. dirty back of the napkin. For example, <laughs> In Chief Kirk's report, he says they have 28 full-time staff. Mm -hmm. You have 29 police officers plus command staff. So let's just say that their budget, now remember, you're out of the fire business. Right. You don't have trucks, you don't have stations, you don't have staff, you don't have staff to train, to uniform, you don't have picks and shovels, you don't have anything. So <coughs> down and dirty, back of the napkin, just the personnel cost. For this, let me let me get my numbers. I've got them all. For the police department, we're using that as a comparison because they're very equivalent. Just the personnel numbers: no training, no utilities, no buildings, no trucks. No trucks <laughs> is 2.52 million every year. Your current your current is 1.25. That's what you're paying now. So already, <coughs> just because you would have to staff back up. You're already getting a deal. Yeah, I don't think there's any of the questions. The fact that we were not anywhere near close taking back on. Right. We're getting so back I'm in the fire. Just down and dirty back of the napkin, and two <coughs> was 1.64 million dollars in 2008, and you would need at least two. That's without land acquisition. So down and dirty. If those are the kind of numbers you want to fold into this study, or you already, I don't want to insult your intelligence. You already know, but you're working just. Because when you do cost benefit, well, your benefit is obviously that you are below national level for response times. Everything you asked for in your contract, you got in spades. I don't. I'm not real sure where else to go with nope. the cost benefit analysis other than just the. For price. me, it's a comparison. Yeah, it's the cost of renegotiating a contract that would extend further with a set fee term like the 1.225, and continuing that and renegotiating that versus falling under fire district and having it actually part of the levy. That's what my comparison is <coughs> yeah. Not not the cost of providing fire service. We're we're out of the fire That's game that. and you getting back to in. About that. Okay. Right. I think we've passed the point of no return. You on. pretty much did when you yeah. did this right. in two thousand ten. Contract and versus no contract. Right. I mean that's really contract versus they're taking over. Exactly. Right. exactly. Okay. And That's the comparison I think is what we yeah. need to look at. And, and some of that is is a matter for their board to decide whether or not they want to it's too oh, extreme, right. absolutely. We both have to be completely. <coughs> and my point on that was some of the benefit, I can't really assign a dollar value to. Sure. So that was, you know, response yeah. times, what do you do? Priceless. So anyway, that was all I had to say for that. I believe I'm the next item as well. Okay. Okay. I don't know if you're done with me, but I don't have anything else to say. <laughs> okay. Second. New business item number three. Consider adopting an ordinance amending Article 5, Section 23, and Article 19, Section 200 of the Standard Trash Ordinance for Kansas City's edition of 2014, which was incorporated by Ordinance Number 2460. And this would be. <coughs> Gina, so nice to provide me. List of what it would be now I'm looking. 20, this would be ordinance number 2464. Laura. Uh, <coughs> after we so promptly 
adopted by reference <coughs> new 